This video was originally recorded May 2018 at Tibet House US in New York City. To watch the full archive recording, please visit tibethouse.us. Then you're nothing. And that's what we, th but we're not nothing, okay? We're here. And therefore, it could be a lot worse. As Garrison Keillor used to say before he was exiled for manhandling. It could be worse. So therefore, we're all happy, actually. We're completely happy. We're over here, you know, listening to Sharon and Mark, and I'm annoying you, <laughs> and them. And look, you're smiling. And your body is holding together, and you know what? That why it is because your under thigh there likes your upper thigh there, and so you're happy to cross your legs. And your body is happy with itself. And if you let your gloominess get into your body, you know what that is. That will you'll be ill. So you're made of bliss, actually. That's what Buddha discovered. Don't give me this. It doesn't take a Buddha to discover suffering. The Indians are not stupid. If some guy announced, hey, this is all suffering, <laughs> they would say, what is he? Simple-minded, he never stubbed his toe? <laughs> he never, like, cut his finger? Like, he didn't, like, lose his girlfriend? Or he had, like, a number of them, but, you know, they didn't annoy him? Of course, that's not what Buddha discovered. Buddha discovered bliss. The third noble truth, but he was like, he was clever like a psychiatrist. He didn't call it bliss, he called it relief. Because <laughs> he knew he wouldn't get arrested for talking about relief. If he talked about bliss, they'd all suspect him. <coughs> Seriously. But relief is bliss, don't you think? Relief of suffering is bliss. What else is bliss? And that's how you have to see people if you're going to see them as well. And you're going to have to see that actually they know that, or they wouldn't show up at your office. But they are convinced that it's really not right, it's not good enough, and this and that. And, and then in our culture, it's terrible, because there's no former life, and therefore everything wrong gets blame on mom and dad. <laughs> they just did it wrong. They didn't read Dr. Spock. They didn't read Winnicott. So they weren't good enough moms. They, were, they just were pain, you know. They, they, they did this, and now I'm neurotic, and it's all their fault. And luckily, you're going to be a better mom and a better dad for me, so then, you know, then you're helping me, you know. Anyway, I know, I don't want to go into it too much. But the point is, Buddha discovered bliss. And that's the relief, you know. And as your love is on this side, and understanding is on that side. You're so brilliant, Mark. Love is over here, understanding is over there, and in a way they're the same thing. Because if you understand yourself, you will count your blessings, and you'll find your bliss. You won't do like the New Yorker cartoon that I didn't like, <laughs> where they, you know, Joseph Campbell famously said to Bill Moyers, follow your bliss. Remember, I don't know if you remember that. Some of you will remember mm -hmm. that. So they had a cartoon in the New Yorker 20 years later, and there was a guy out in front of a church who was panhandling with a tin cup. And he had a sign on his chest that said, I followed my bliss. <laughs> he wanted a quarter, you know, to get a hot dog to go along with the bliss. You know? So that's the third noble truth. And that's real happiness. Mm. And it's not only, it's real happiness, period. I think it was the more fun one, and real, hap <laughs> real happiness at work. Right, that wasn't as much <laughs> that fun. That was a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was talking to some people just lately in, in Honolulu, and they were in a little gloomy mood because it was raining, and the, and the volcano blew up on the island next door. But they're very worried about America, because pretty soon robots are going to be doing everything and there's going to be no jobs. Much worse than now they're blaming it on immigrants, and they're blaming it on globalization, and they're blaming it on whatever.
but uh, but then finally it's just that there will be no one left to blame it on, and, and then nobody will be work. And and the one thing that he, this person was reporting to me some conferences about that with Silicon Valley moguls and all the people talking about the the, the robots, you know. <laughs> And the truck drivers are all going to be out of work. What are we going to do with all the truck drivers being out of work? And the truck stops will be depopulated. Um, none of them had thought, how about changing the culture where you don't feel you have to work and you don't feel your worth is by working and sweating somewhere and suffering, but you could just have worth by being a human being. What would happen? How could that be? How could that be done? And of course, these people are all super workaholics, so they couldn't imagine that, so they didn't think of that as a solution. But that's what Buddhist monks do. Look at these Zen monks. Buddha, <laughs> do you know how Buddha appeared to his mom? Do any of you know the legend? When she, she had a dream and this thing came to her. Uh, and if you saw little Buddha, it was stupidly rendered as she was dancing around in a garden with a weird-looking baby elephant. That's really dumb. What appeared to her was a white elephant. How does a white elephant come to mean a useless thing? <laughs> Isn't that what it means in our culture, a white elephant? I wonder the, oh, the, the, the trajectory true. of that in history. White elephants Buddha so. appeared as a white elephant, a useless thing in the sense of normal production. If you don't produce, you're worthless, right? That's our culture. But how, we can easily change that, I think. But, and then what are, we, what are they doing? Oh, welfare queens, you know, social systems bad. Oh, Scandinavia. Well, Scandinavians do tend to be depressed. <laughs> they do. <coughs> you know, over there. My dad was an alcoholic. And they're all alcoholics. But that's because it's too cold all the time. <laughs> you know, and they, it's very cold. And if you dilute your blood with alcohol, it doesn't bother you as much. You know? So they're medicating themselves. But unfortunately, it has a bad effect on their liver and they get depressed. Unless they can go to Spain, you know, in this winter, which they do. So, so bliss is it, okay? That's what Buddha discovered, not suffering. And he only mentioned suffering because he discovered bliss. Because when you suffer, it's because you're not fully aware of your own reality. And another thing we're all repressing in this culture is that a lot of these near death. How many of you have read a lot of near death experience literature? Anybody? A bit? Of course, we were just doing this in, in Maui about death, you know. But, you know, one thing that I think people are nervous to read near death experience is very often the near death people, which means the sort of the ones who clinically die, kind of, but then come back. They usually don't want to come back. They're feeling blissful. And then some, you know, Jesus shows up, or a mentor, or a shaman, or some bodhisattva, and says, not your time, go back. And then, zoom, they go backward down the white light tunnel, and they're back on the operating table, and somebody's carving on them, you know. Like, we're going to put them back together again, <laughs> you know, for the, the latest auto accident. You know? So, in the Vimal... This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special trips with Robert Thurman and friends with geographic expeditions, please visit tibethouse.us. Tashi Delek, and thanks for tuning in.